Hi, this is Joe with Prep Agent. I'm here with my two friends, Amanda and Morgan. Hi, Morgan. Hi. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Okay, so we're going to go over some questions that they gave me to review so they could pass their real estate exam. Um, are you guys nervous? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right, we'll relax. We're going to get through this. It's going to be fine. And we're going to use these questions to go over some concepts so you could pass. Okay, so let's go to the first question. Um, Morgan, how about you take the first one? Do you want to read this one out loud? Okay. Uh, which of the following best describes the capitalization rate under the income approach of appraising real estate? Rate at which a property increases in value? Rate of return a property earns as an investment? Rate of capital required to keep a property operating most efficiently, and then maximum rate of return by law on an investment. Okay, so we're talking about appraisal approaches here. Okay, so Amanda, I'm going to throw a question at you right now. You ready? Yes. What kind of approaches to appraisal are you familiar with? Give me one. Um, the um. Cost approach. Cost approach is one. Cost replacement approach is the full word. Okay, okay. Morgan, you give me another. Can you give me another? Uh, is there an income approach? I think? Good. That's a good one. That's actually a very relevant one to right now. Excellent. Capitalization income approach. Amanda, give me one more. Um, the market value data approach. Market data comparison approach. Great. Oh, okay. Uh, and whoever gets this one can answer first. Which approach do you use when you're trying to find the value of your house that you live in right now? Market value? Excellent. Good. Basically, you look at your house. Bill's house is worth 500 grand. Yours is worth 500 grand, assuming they're the same. Easy. Cost replacement approach, what's that one about? Um... I'm not for sure. Would it be? The answer is right in the name. Cost replacement. How much would it cost to replace it brand new? Oh, okay. So remember, Wait, don't overthink it. Sometimes the answer is right there in front of you. And the next one we have is the income approach, which is what this question is about. So we're looking at this slide here. So I got a little mall here. You see that blue shop in the middle? Mm-hmm. So we have a bunch of stores here. People are shopping. What would be an important determining factor for how much I'm going to offer to pay for that blue shop right in the middle of all the other shops? What do you guys think? How much the other stores make, I guess? That would be one thing, um, but it may not be the most important thing. Man, what do you think? Um... What, did you ask me, like, uh, what's the most important thing about the blue shop? Right. Remember, we're not buying a house here. This isn't your residential house. And we're not buying, uh, like, a library. This is a store. Since it's a, a business, probably how much the business makes? Yeah. If that business is rocking, it's got a million people going through every day, I pay more for it. And if nobody's there, if nobody ever goes in that store, do you want to pay a lot for it? No. 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 So what you guys are saying is that income is related into value. So the capitalization income approach turns income into value. Like we said with the store, if it's a lot of people doing business there, I pay more for it. How much more? That's what the capitalization income approach does. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right, here we go. Let's look at this question again. All right, Amanda, you read it this time. Which of the following best describes the capitalization rate under the income approach of appraising real estate? A, rate at which a property increases in value. B, rate of return a property earns as an investment. C, rate of capital required to keep a property operating most efficiently. Or D, maximum rate of return by law on an investment. Okay, what do you guys think? 
I think maybe C. Okay. So Morgan thinks C. Amanda, what do you think? Um. I was thinking B or D, because B says rate of return a property earns as an investment. Which is a fancy way of saying income. And then D says maximum rate of return by law on an investment. And I don't know what by law means, but. And B is the answer. So, oh, okay. So nice yeah. job. Um, and I love that when you weren't sure about D, you didn't go with it. You went with your gut. Always go with your gut. So if you're not sure of something, don't circle it. Trust in the material you studied. Okay, so rate of return of property earns. So basically, it's a fancy way of saying income. Okay, so that's the income approach. Okay, you guys, okay. The next one? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, Amanda, read this one out loud. Which of the following states that finance charges must be stated as an annual percentage rate? A, Truth and Lending Act, B, Real Estate Procedure Act, Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act, C, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or D, Fair Housing Act. Okay, so Morgan, I'm going to ask you a question now. You ready? Okay. What can you tell me about any one of those four things? Just pick one, and then Amanda will go next. So you get to start. Any one of those four things. Um, this is the areas that I'm really not the best in, um, but I haven't read it in a while. Don't worry, I can, I'll help you. Okay, the Fair Housing Act is basically making sure that everyone is treated equally when it comes to yep. Good. buying or purchasing a home. Right, so basically you can't discriminate, right? Right. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So you do know. Confidence, confidence. Okay. <laughs> okay. Amanda, you want to take one? Um, C, Equal Credit Opportunity Act is also about discrimination, um, about giving loans to uh, people not based on their ethnicity. Good. So it's basically their credit. Okay. So yeah. what's the other two about? Um, I think the RES, the RESPA Act is about mortgage, uh, the, maybe the procedures for when closing, I, RESPA, I know it's RESPA, so Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act. I believe it's like procedures about either closing, closing for the house or some type of paperwork. You're close. You're very close. I'm going to help you. But you definitely know more than you give yourself credit for. So you're going to be okay. okay. All right. So first, I want to ask you guys something. So Amanda, you got a loan on a house, right? Yeah. What did they tell you you were going to be paying? How did they tell you? Well, Morgan actually is a new home buyer, um, so it's probably more fresh in her mind. Okay, Morgan, when you got a loan on a house and they told you mm -hmm. how much you're paying, what did they tell you? When they told me how much I'm paying? Yes, on the loan. Did they give you one neat number? Or did they give you like a million different numbers that were confusing and horrible for you? They were a, a lot of different numbers, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, they should have given you one big number called the APR. Did they say anything to you about an APR? Oh, yes. The interest rate? Good. That's that annual percentage rate. And that's pretty important. That's meant for like uh, somebody getting a loan who doesn't understand everything to be able to understand what they're paying, understand the fees. Right, okay. So they should have given you like one comprehensible number so that they didn't give you a million different fees and different things like a we screwed you tax, a hop fee, a, you're a sucker charge, all those things you don't understand. It's just one nice little mm -hmm. bundle number. It's called the annual percentage rate, okay? Right. And that's relevant, so you gotta know that. Okay, okay. Next, you have the Truth in Lending Act, okay? So Truth in Lending is basically designed to make sure that when you got that loan, you understood what you were paying. And the way they right. make it understandable is that APR, that annual percentage rate number. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act 
Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys a question. You hire me as an agent, and you ask me, who's a good title rep? Who's a good lender? I give you one. You expect them to be a good title rep and lender because you trust me, correct? Right. What if you found out the only reason I gave you that title rep or lender is because they told me they'd give me 50 bucks if I give you the, if I send the business to the Would you be okay with that? No, I wouldn't. You'd be pissed no. off, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because now you don't know if they're really good or if I'm just sending you the business because they're giving me 50 bucks. All right. That's called a kickback. And that's what RESPA is there to protect against. You'll hear agents say all the time, RESPA, RESPA, RESPA violation. They'll say it all the time. However, what RESPA is really relevant to is giving kickbacks to people, to third-party settlement services. Amanda, what's an example of a settlement service? Do you know what they're talking about? Uh, like a home inspector? Good. So inspector, appraisers, lenders, things of that nature. Okay. Next, we have the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. As Amanda said, makes it unlawful for creditors to discriminate against applicants. And fair housing, once again, it's about discrimination. Fair Housing Act protects people against discrimination when they're renting, buying, or securing financing for any housing. Okay, so let's look at this question again. What do you guys think? So who wants to read this one out loud? Um, I will. Okay, go okay. for it. Which of the following states that finance charges must be stated as a annual percentage rate? Is it the Truth in Lending Act, Real Estate Settlement Procedure Act, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or the Fair Housing Act? Which one do you think? Um, I think it is the Truth in Lending Act. Amanda, I agree. I agree. Perfect. Little factoid for you. There you go. Very exciting. Yeah. Uh, the Truth in Lending Act is actually what introduced that APR. So not only does it have to do with it, it is the cause of it. The Truth in Lending Act. The Truth in Lending Act is what said, hey, this is getting way too complicated. People don't know what they're paying for. You got to make one nice annual percentage rate. And that was called the APR. Sounds right. good? Yep. Okay. Who wants to read this one? I will since she read the last one. Okay. What type of lease establishes a rental payment and requires the leasor to pay for taxes, insurance, and maintenance on the property? A, net, B, percentage, C, gross, or D, none of the above? Okay. Before we get into anything here, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who's the lessor? The person that is leasing their place. I agree. Who do they lease it to? The leasee or the lessee. Excellent. Okay, do you guys know the O-R-E-E -E rule? Yes. Tell me the O-R-E-E -E rule. Well, I usually just know the ORs for usually the owners or the person that's kind of... Um, I would just remember it by having like ownership and then the EE are usually the people that are receiving the. Yeah. Good. Okay. And so this is going to sound ridiculous, but you're going to pass your exam. We want to pass the exam, right? We don't care if we sound ridiculous, right? right? Mm -hmm. OR is the give or. EE receives. Okay. Always. So you may understand lessor and lessee. But things like option or option e, vendor, vendee, trust or trustee, mortgage or mortgagee, gift or gifty, it can get a little confusing, right? Yeah. All right. But it doesn't matter. As long as you know the OR is giving and the EE receives, you're going to pass. Yeah. Okay. The gist of it is you may not remember all the words I said, but as long as you remember EE receives and OR gives, you'll be fine. Okay. 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 Always remember that. And this question is pretty obvious. But on your exam, you may see harder questions where you're talking about deeds, um, options, things that get a little more tricky than just a lesson or a lessee. Sound good? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, that being said, the matter at hand, net percentage and gross. What's that? 
So what's a net lease? Um, is a net? No, that's a net. That's not the lease. I thought the net, um, I think that's different from what I'm talking about. I just remember something about the net where you can, you make more growth is, Net is like I just I don't know if this is the same thing as far as leases, but where the agent can make, like, say you wanted to sell a house for no, 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 that's a net. No, listing. that's different. Oh, net listing. Okay. The net listing. Okay. Well, let me okay. ask you this: Have you rented property in your life? Yes. Did you pay a set fee? Yes. Which lease is that out of these three? Amanda, what do you I think? I think it would be gross lease. Good. So your average residential rental is a gross lease. You pay $1,000 a month. That's it. That's the deal. There's nothing else. Okay. So the net lease, the tenant pays for tax insurance and maintenance. That's more common in commercial leases, very often known as a triple net lease. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah me right. too. Okay. Yeah. A gross lease, tenant pays a flat amount. That's typical in your average residential property, okay? A percentage lease is an agreement where the rental's based upon a monthly or annual gross sales made on the premise. Obviously an agreement when you're dealing with like shopping centers and malls and things of that nature. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, who wants to take a stab at this one? Your turn, Morgan. Okay, read it out loud. <laughs> okay. What type of lease establishes a rental payment and requires the lessor to pay for taxes, insurance, and maintenance on the property? And I think it's B. Amanda, what do you really? think? Um, what type of lease establishes? No, it's not B. It's A. Sorry. I agree with Morgan. A. All right. Good. Okay, there it is, triple net. Taxes, insurance, maintenance, right there. Now remember, right. triple net is actually slang. It's not proper terminology. So you not may not see that on your exam, but they say triple net for this reason. Maintenance, insurance, and taxes. Gotcha. Okay? Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, we're on number four, and we got seven going tonight. Okay, the landlord of an apartment building neglected to repair the building's plumbing system. As a result, the apartment did not receive water. If the tenant's unit becomes uninhabitable, what is the most likely result? A, suit for possession. B, claim for constructive eviction. C, tenancy at sufferance. Or D, suit for negligence. Okay, so we're talking about what's going on here. You have a landlord, and he's just not taking care of the building. He's not letting you get water. It's freezing. It's horrible. It's gross. It's a terrible place. Do you have to live there? No. No. Okay, so when you look at these answers, which immediately would you guys cross off? Oh. A. I would cross off A. Okay, now here's why. Have you yeah. ever heard that in your real estate book? No. Then don't circle it. So as you guys take your test, and you both said you're pretty nervous, one of the things I want you to remember is you're not as nervous. If you've never heard of it, don't circle it. Okay? Okay. People who are nervous tend to second-guess themselves. Like, wow, that sounds really important. It sounds like a really smart thing. I didn't study very well, and I don't feel comfortable, so maybe that's it. Don't do that. And my point is, okay. If you've never heard of it before, maybe there's a reason. What is the reason? You didn't need to know it. Therefore, it's not an answer. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. So that's so a great... I will cross off A and B because I don't remember really. And I love that you did that. Um, yeah. That is absolutely perfect. Okay. So now we're left, and here's why I think you're great, Morgan. You ready for this next slide? Uh-huh. Boom. 
is state at sufferance and constructive eviction. Okay? So I crossed yeah. off the same ones you did. That's why we're on the same page. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which leads me to the question. What's the difference between those two things? Um, I think the construction eviction is when the landlord can evict you and then maybe the estate. I'm just assuming because I'm not for sure, but the estate at sufferance is when maybe you're suffering and you can leave based on so you on actually a have a condition. You actually have it backwards. Do I? Okay. <laughs> I thought so, but then I was thinking a state of sufferance, like sufferance. That's what I thought. Okay. Okay, so let's back up. You have freehold estates and less than freehold estates. What's a freehold estate? Oh, I've been. I need to watch your. I watched one of your videos on YouTube the other day. I need to rewatch about. Morgan's that. the one that told me to go on YouTube, and that's how I found you, Joe. Great. I love that you. Yeah, did. I just pay for your. I just pay for a week access. That's why I thought it was the same guy. Lady. For, oh, that's funny. You're going on tangents. I love that you guys watch my YouTube videos and refer to it, but we still got to answer my question of what is stated sufferance is. I don't know. I, I caught you guys going on tangents there, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't know, though. Okay. Um, so let's back up here. All right. So we have the freehold estate and less than freehold estate. Freehold estate is when you have unlimited duration ownership. And there's things like fee simple absolute, fee simple defeasible, life estates, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Less than freehold estate are leases. And you have estate for years, periodic tenancy, estate at will, and an estate at sufferance. And that oh, yeah. brought that up because that's where that comes in. Right, okay. Do you, are you guys familiar with this or would you let me just explain those yeah. really quickly? Could you go really quickly? Because now I think the state for sufferance is when a person won't leave. Yes. Is that what it is? Okay. Great. Oh, I remember that now. Okay, yeah, I kind of remember that. You guys know so much more than you think you do. You guys just need a boost of confidence. That's all you guys need. Um, <laughs> so in a state of sufferance, this is why I said it was backwards. The landlord is the one suffering in the estate of sufferance. Not okay. the tenant. So real quick, because we have another video on this. I won't spend too much time on this. You have less than freehold estates. Estate for years is the best one for a landlord because a specific period of time you're renting. Could be months, years, weeks. A great example is a summer rental. Why is it the best? Because I know when you're leaving the moment you move in so I can look for another tenant. Okay? Right. Periodic tenancy is like a month to month. A uh, state at will means you could leave at any time. And what's the only thing worse than somebody leaving at any time? Not somebody leaving. Who doesn't leave at all. Suffering. Yeah, mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't leave at all. In layman's terms, it's called a deadbeat. <laughs> right? I mean, to put it in more comprehensible terms. The landlord's suffering. And if you've ever had to deal with this, it's horrible when somebody stays there. Because they had permission to go in at one point. It's not trespass. They had permission at one point. Trespass is when you never had permission to be there in the first place. So it's a very difficult procedure. Right. So with that being the definition of a state of sufferance, what's constructive eviction all about? I think that's when you, when you're in uninhabitable living situations, you can leave. So who's suffering now? The renter or the or the lessee to go with our previous terminology yeah okay so a state of sufferance who's suffering so let's answer that question who's suffering with the estate of sufferance the landlord the landlord or the lessor, lessor. yeah the lessor is suffering okay and you like my little picture of the guy freezing and really cold yeah yeah Okay, so Amanda, read that definition for me. Constructive eviction, a circumstance in which a landlord either does something or fails to do something that he has a legal duty to provide. Okay, so with that being said, 
Let's look at this question again. <laughs> okay. I'll read it. Okay. The landlord of an apartment building neglected to repair the building's plumbing system. As a result, the apartment did not receive water. If the tenant's unit becomes uninhabitable, what is most likely result? Uh, a, suit for, for possession. B, claim for constructive eviction. C, tenancy at sufferance. Or D, suit for negligence. And what's the answer? B. Good. So now we're going with the logic here. Right off the bat, Morgan eliminated A and D. Okay? So after she eliminated A and D, the question then became, who's suffering? And once we realize the tenant is suffering, if we know our vocabulary, we know it's B, constructive eviction. Makes gotcha. Sense? Yep. Okay. Morgan, how you doing? I'm good. Learning? We're learning? Yeah. Okay, good. Oh, that's a long one. It is a long one. <clears throat> okay, do you want me to read it or? One of you yeah. have to, yeah. Okay. <laughs> a seller lists her home with a real estate professional for $220,000, but tells the real estate professional, who is acting as the seller's agent, I have got to sell quickly because of a job transfer. If necessary, I can accept a price as low as 175000 The real estate professional tells the prospective buyer to offer 180000 because the seller is desperate to sell. The seller accepts the buyer's office. In this situation, which statement is true? A, the real estate professional violated an established agency relationship with the seller. B, the real estate professional actions did not violate any agency relationship with the seller because the real estate professional did not actually reveal the seller's lowest acceptable price. C, the real estate professional acted properly, obtained a quick offer, acted properly, obtained a quick offer on the seller's property in accordance with the seller's instructions. D, the real estate professional violated established fiduciary duties towards the buyer, failing to disclose that the seller would accept a lower price than the buyer offered. Okay, so we're looking at this question. So basically, I as a seller told you, hey, I'm in a bad spot, I gotta sell this quickly, okay? You turned around and told the buyer, hey, this guy's gotta sell quickly, he's screwed, offer lower. Would the seller be happy about that? No. What did they violate? They violated their fiduciary responsibilities. Excellent. What is that, confidentiality? No, I love the fact that you used the word fiduciary. That's what I was looking for, the fiduciary mm -hmm. relationship. Okay? So right now, you could eliminate anything that says the agent did okay, which is B. We're not okay with that one. Um, so we could get rid of that. And also, ah, here we go. And C. Age is bad. Okay. So what is an agency? On the simplest definition, an agent is a party who acts and in place for a principal. So simply said, I am you. If you're the seller, you're hiring me to speak on your behalf. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. So there's a lot of terms like fiduciary and agency relationship. Sometimes all you have to remember is, would the seller say that to the buyer? Probably not. And if the seller wouldn't say it, neither should you as the agent. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's also a good rule of thumb when you practice real estate. If you're ever wondering, am I breaking the law? Well, am I violating the seller's trust? How do I know I'm violating the seller's trust? If I'm saying something that the seller wouldn't say themselves. All right, so we have a fiduciary relationship. Remember these words, a cold. You see that right there? Yeah. You like that fancy graphic? That's pretty fancy, right? I did that. Mm -hmm. A cold, accountable, care and skill, obey legal instructions, loyal to your client, and disclose all pertinent information. This is not pertinent information. Pertinent information is like a leaky roof or something of that nature. Right. Okay, so let's look at this question again. What do you guys think? 
Here, Amanda, you read it this time. A seller lists her home with a real estate professional for two hundred twenty thousand, but tells the real estate professional, who is acting as the seller's agent, "I have got to sell quickly because of a job transfer. If necessary, I can accept a price as low as one hundred seventy-five thousand." The real estate professional tells a prospective buyer to offer one hundred and eighty thousand because the seller is desperate to sell. The seller accepts the buyer's offer. In this situation, which statement is true? I would say. Yeah, which is I think it's A. You think it's A? Yeah. Ooh. Because he doesn't. She shouldn't have to. Oh. I got it wrong. Yeah. The real estate professional violated an established agency relationship. Also, keep in mind what the state's asking about. They want to know about that agency relationship, that fiduciary duty. So nice. Oh, okay. D said it's towards the buyer failing. It's not. Yeah, no, it the was buyer should be like, sir, I five. Yeah. Great job. Um, yeah. So always ask yourself when you're talking about agency relationship. Would the seller say that themselves? If the answer is no, then you shouldn't be saying it either. As long as it's in the realm of legality, obviously. Okay. Who wants to read this one? Amanda? I'll or Morgan? Whoever wants to. Oh. <laughs> which, which step is among those an appraiser would use in prepping, preparing a real property appraisal using the cost approach. A, estimate the replacement cost of improvement. B, deduct the depression of the land and the building. C, determine the original cost and adjust the cost for depreciation. D, review the prices of comparable property. Okay. So we went over the income approach before. What was that about? We did that earlier in this lesson. What's the income business? Before? Um, how much you would make, you like making money. Uh, right, it would turn income into value. So you right. can use that approach when there's an income to analyze, right? What's right. the market data approach all about? The market data comparison approach. That's for using the, Right. Using and, the different uh, comparable, like, uh, I guess using the market data to get a price yeah you're comparing your house to the ones nearby but here's my question what if there's no income and there's nothing to compare it to then what do you do oh, cause no. well let me ask you this is there a library in your town yes yeah the library's goal to produce income no no, no. is there a comparable library next to it no, probably not. So how would you find the value? Things like libraries, schools, police stations are usually one per town. So you can't really use the market data approach. And their goal is not to bring income. These are called special purpose properties. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. So what you would do is you would look at the cost to replace it with another improvement having the same utility. Basically, how much would it cost to build it brand new? So when you look at the value of that library, you're saying, how much would it cost for me to build it brand new? Like just totally replace everything so it has the same functionality. And that's how you find the value. So it's that's why it's called the cost replacement approach. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So would this approach work better for a new building or an old building? An older building. Mm. No, a new building? Well, can I find the exact replacements for a building that was built in 1910? No. No, well, if a building not. was built yesterday, I could probably build an exact replica and tell you exactly how much it costs to build that. Correct? Uh, yeah. If it was built in 1910, I really can't build it the exact way it was, can I? Right. So if you had to appraise a property in 1910, you'd be using the current cost of reproduction, which is why this approach would be difficult for an older building. Does that make sense? 
So the hardest thing to appraise is a really old building that has no income and no comparables. Okay? Mm hmm All right. Approach is most appropriate for a new building, not an old one. All right. So what's the answer here? Um, which step? Read this one out loud. Uh, which, which step is among the those an appraiser would use in preparing a real estate, a real property appraisal using the cost approach? Would it be A? Read the answer. Which step is among those an appraiser would use in preparing a real property appraisal? So we have A, estimate the replacement a. cost of improvement. B, uh -huh. in the depression of the land in the building. D, determine the original cost and adjust the cost for depreciation. Or D, review the price of comparable properties. I think A. Okay, you think A? Yeah. Amanda, what do you think? Um... Uh, A. Good. Excellent. Okay. Because D has to do with the comparison approach. So that's not it. Right. D determined the original cost. Remember my example for 1910? That's not relevant right. because my costs are not the same as what it cost to originally build it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So all those things I went over, they're important. So when you watch this again or you watch the video later, Really try and see those little keywords I'm giving you because I'm trying to focus down on things to really help you understand the concept without a lot of extra fluff. So that when I say new, not old, there's a reason. Okay? Gotcha. All right. Last one. Are you guys ready? One more? Yep. Okay. So just a little disclosure for everybody watching this in YouTube land. This one is not relevant to every state. Okay, we're talking about townships here. And so this is relevant to your state. If you've heard things like baseline, meridian, township, section, by all means, watch. If it's not relevant, you can sign off now. We'll see you later. But for Amanda and Morgan, this is relevant. So let's do it. Okay, who wants to read this one? I will. In a, okay. <laughs> in, a town, in a township, which statement is true? A, Section 31 lies to the east of Section 32. B, Section 18 is by law set aside for school purposes. C, Section 6 lies in the northeast corner of a township. Or D, Section 16 lies to the north of Section 21. Okay, so let's back up here. So what we have here is townships and sections. You see this little graph I got going here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, you look scared. You're like, oh, my God, it's horrible. This. Super easy. This. this is super easy. <laughs> okay. So I have the baseline and meridian. Okay. Those mm -hmm. little blocks to the east, west, north, and south are called townships. Okay. Which is what this question's asking about. You with me so far? Yeah. Each township is six miles by six miles. You see my little six here and six there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So basically what they do is they find, this is how you find land. Think of terms when there's no houses, no streets. How would you find uh, an area? You're used to looking up on what? Siri or Google Maps and find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's a few, I mean, there's streets and everything. This is before the land was laid down. So you pick a point. That's your baseline meridian where it crosses. Then you go six miles up, six miles over, and everything's in blocks. So I'm in this block right here. See my little light going? Mm -hmm. Okay, six miles by six miles. That's a township. So let's zoom in on this block. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're in that little block there, six miles over, six miles up. This is that block zoomed in. Mm. This is 36 square miles. 36 square miles. You see that? Mm -hmm. Going back here, six by six. You following me? Yeah. 
Super mm -hmm. easy. You get this? It's an easy one right on your exam. I really want you to understand this. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, these little blocks are called sections. Okay? Now, there's 36 of them. So if a township's 36 square miles, how big is each section if there are 36 sections? One mile? Yeah, one square mile. Okay, these are 36 square miles here, and there's 36 sections, okay? So what mm -hmm. they do is they find out what township you're in, okay? And then they'll say you're in section 15 in that township, right there, okay? And then they found you in a one square mile area. And then they do things that you're in the northeast corner, the northwest side, and it gets really detailed down to find the exact spot you're in. But that question doesn't ask about this just yet. Okay? So what's interesting about this box? What do you notice that's really weird about it? The numbers kind of go. Yeah. Right. The numbers go in this kind of snake-like fashion. If you follow my mouse, do you see? Mm -hmm. You gotta know that for your exam. If you could just remember this fact that one starts up here, 36 ends there, and you gotta fill in numbers as if it's all connected like a string. Like you can't go one, two, three, five, six, then start over here. You have to let it flow like a long string. Does okay. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If you could draw this map, you're good to go. So remember, it started here with the township, baseline, meridian, is my point of intersection right there, six by six. Go into the township, I have my sections within a township. And now if we look at the question, in a township, which statement is true? And I'll just do this one with you because you won't know without looking at the graph. Section 31 lies to the east of section 32. Well, I drew my little graph. 31 and 32. Okay, that's to the west. So it's not to the east. Okay, so that's not correct. Okay. Section 18 is by law set aside for school purpose. I don't know what that's all about. That's just crazy. Section 6 lies in the northeast corner of the township, okay? That's northwest. And you'll have a little east-west diagram when you're there, okay? Okay. Yeah, don't worry. It'll be there. Section 16 lies to the north of section 21. 16, 21, right there. That's true. Which is why west, east, north, south, okay? Mm-hmm. So therefore, the answer is D. Do you understand what I'm saying? This one's an easy one to get right as long as you know to draw this little map just like this. Right. Okay. Now, a little tricky thing here is I may ask you how big is a township? How big is a township? 36 square miles. Is that always true? Yes. No. Because what if it's located oh. next to, like, a river or something? Then it's cut off. Oh. Never trust in words like always. These are absolutes. Words like always, never, are not that great. Words like sometimes, usually, almost, that makes you feel good. It gives room for exceptions to the rule. Be very careful when you circle absolute. What do I mean by absolutes? Always, never, things of that nature. Does that make sense? Yes. Because almost always there's an exception to every rule. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies. So that's it for the evening. I hope you guys learned something tonight. Did you learn anything? Yeah. Yes. We went over some tests. I learned huh? about, um, like cost approach and income approach and market value. Good. So we did some test taking techniques, we learned some concepts. So hopefully you're good to go. If anybody has any questions, just write below. Other than that, um, this is Joe with Prep Agent. Until next time. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Joe.